their mark. And we know that children are not always safe in their own homes. The quality of parenting is pretty much a lottery if you are a child. But at least here, where there are resources and we have this extraordinary um, uh, championing and advocacy for children, we can, help parenting to be we can help parents to become better parents. We can teach parents to become better parents. We can challenge attitudes to unreasonable punishment. We can vindicate children who are unreasonably, who are treated violently and brutally. We can encourage supportive environments because the child we know, the child that is praised, the child that is loved, I don't mean the child that is overindulged because children like limits, but the child that is loved, that is praised, that is told, well, actually, no, you can't do that. As I often say to my own children, they're sick hearing it. I'd love to let you do that. If I was your best friend, I would certainly let you do that. But here's the bad news. I'm your mummy. <laughs> and I'm not letting you do that. And here are the reasons why. And the child that is given those kind of limits is a child who grows up knowing that the limits are imposed fairly, reasonably, for their safety, out of love. The child who grows up brutalised, the child who is thumped for big things, small things, and for no reason at all, is a child who doesn't know what the limits in the world are, doesn't know where the limits are, doesn't know what the rules are, because the mixed messages are so appalling. And so we have to be careful for those children, the children who are all around us. And we here, we can promote vigilance of our neighbours, our friends, our teachers, the care professionals, our police, our social work professionals, those who interact with the children, keeping an eye out for situations in which children need the protection, the vindication of their rights from possibly outside their own home. So we're a lot wiser today because we've talked these things through and God knows we'll get plenty, not to say that we have solved it, don't get me wrong, there are still, there are still so many children suffering, we know that. But we now have a kind of a cynical wisdom that helps us to probe the dark secret places where children in the past in this country and on this island have been so vulnerable and where they remain vulnerable, not just here but in many parts of the world. So what do our children need to probe those dark spaces where they will not understand what is going on until they are 20, 30, 40, by which time it is too late, lives skewed. They need you, they need champions, they need advocates, people who invest in those early years so that what's learnt in childhood is engraved well, engraved beautifully, like the person who engraves the rings, you know, that the girls like to wear the engagement rings, the lovely sparkling stones, that when they started out didn't look anything like they look when they're in the ring. Some engraver has to take that lump, you know, that just looks to you and I like any piece of stone and turn it into a remarkable diamond. And that, I know, is what you commit your lives to, to making every child's life a diamond life, a life with so many facets, so many facets that glow, that are not, that are not deprived of light, that are not deprived of a beautiful cut, something that draws the eye to beauty. We do not want our children to go through life into adulthood, having a mark that draws the eye because it's not a good mark, because it's damage engraved too deeply. So the advances that you make here, the things that you share, are so important. Every one of you will have the same story to tell from your own jurisdictions. You have your own unique experience that informs and helps inform you, helps inform all of us. In that sharing, it is so important. The great mathematics of sharing information, it's not like sharing the chocolate bar, thankfully. When you share information, the mathematics are the opposite. You divide nothing. You let good flow where it will, do more good, even more good than it would do if you kept it locked up in your own jurisdiction, your own profession, your own area, your own home. I, um, I stood in a school, um, must be about three, three years ago now, maybe a little bit more, in a developing country uh, where they are doing really good work in rolling out um, first level education for children trying to meet the Millennium Goals. And I went to a school in a remote place 
uh, where they were very proud of their school and very proud of um, the help they were getting from governments around the world. And it's a remote place, very hard to get to. There are no roads. Some of the children had to walk three, mi three hours to get to school. And some of them even had to cross very difficult terrain, swim across ravines, swim across gorges. Um, extraordinary, heroic efforts to get to school every day. And then, of course, three, mi three hours back. And um, one of the teachers told me very proudly how if the children were five minutes late for school, she sent them home. I almost died on the spot. And then we went into the classroom and strung across the classroom there was a huge sign about a foot high and I guess maybe 12 feet, 14 feet long. And on that sign was written, the following are slow learners and the names of the children. And she proudly pointed it out to me. And I have to say, I stood there and I prayed to God that the slow learners were so slow that they really did not, were unable to read their names. <laughs> I really thought, please God. And then I said to myself, no, because you know what's going to happen? Some spoiled kid there who doesn't know any better is already bullying that dyslexic child, is already bullying that hungry child, is already making snide comments to the hard of hearing child or the autistic child in that classroom, in that place that has yet to discover pedagogically all those labels. I do not blame those teachers. I do not blame them. We have the tools and the resources to help their pedagogy move from where ours was 50 years ago. Because 50 years ago, that was our schools. Let me be frank, that was our schools. So we have the pedagogy, we have the knowledge, we can help these children to fast forward to the kind of place where school is not a place of fear, as it was for many of us, including myself, I may say, um, but a place of fun, a place of fun. And then someone told me too that many of those children go home to houses where 11 and 12 year olds are their carers because their parents have died from AIDS. So, you know, we owe those kids. What do they know? We're the big people around here. We're the big people. They're depending on us to have this resource to share it, get it out there, get it moving. Not gummed up, not jammed up, but actually flowing through their lives, making a difference. And I know that's why you're here. That's exactly what brought you these long, long, long journeys. That's what brought you here, because you believe with real passion and real commitment that we can make a difference in these children's lives. This is not how things need to be. There is good practice. There are things that work well. There's a great expression in the Irish language. It says, Mullen Oiga August Chukishi. And it translates as, praise the young and they will blossom. And it is the truest thing. You and I know, and we're big people. If somebody says something nice to us and says, you know, God, that was a great job you did the other day. Our hearts lift, you know. We're, we human beings, our, our psyches are so fragile, you know. One small little word of a compliment and we, f we can feel good for the rest of the day. But one word of denigration, just one word, one sarky comment, and we go to bed with chunks of concrete clunking round inside us. That's what we are. How much worse is it for the little child? How much worse? And I'm here because I 